We've been in this series called Hearing God, and today I want to give you five ways to experience God. And before I give you these five things, I want to bust a couple of myths. Perhaps the biggest myth is that God's will is difficult to find. I think even in the modern world, if you grew up in church, maybe you've heard something like this, God has a very specific plan and will for your life. And you've got to find it. No pressure, right? (laughs) They typically leave out the no pressure part. But how many of you have ever heard that? You're like, God has a specific, particular, like a blueprint and plan for your life and you've got to find it. Just just a show of of hands. Yeah, I've heard that before. That's kind of been propagated in the the modern church. Uh, The only problem with that is even though God knows everything in advance because he's outside of time, he knows everything that's going to happen. The problem with with that and and that idea and the kind of thinking that that leads to is, is is it's not biblical. I mean, just think about this for a second. If God's got a blueprint for your life, and you've got to figure it out. That means you could make one mistake and throw everything else off track. Does that make sense to you? Like if I miss it in this particular moment, then the dominoes ripple out. God had this blueprint and I messed it up. Okay, let me just give you some good news right now. Is everybody listening? You're not that powerful. You're just not. You can do some stupid things and mess up your life and God can still operate in the context of that. Now, don't do the stupid things because it does mess up your life. Is everybody paying attention? But there's this idea that you can make a decision that just throws everything else off track for the rest of your life and you messed it up and you're gonna die one day and you're gonna look back to when you were 16 and you just threw everything off in that moment and God's gonna be like, really? And that, that's just not true. God has a plan for your life, but that plan is primarily about who you are becoming. It's about your character. It's about your deciding to trust him, to do what he says in every area of your life. And and, and somewhere along the way in the modern church, we made it like a crystal ball thing. And if you don't get it right, woo, and God's playing peekaboo and it's really hard, you know, good luck, right? Right? We've kind of made it this thing that, 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 it's, that it's not. God's will is not hard to find. God's will is, is in God's word. Something I say regularly here at Sun Valley. So stop looking for a sign and start looking for a verse. Principally, everything that you need in this life is found in God's word. And his will is, is wrapped around who you're becoming. The kind of person you, you are. And yet we've made it all all. all mysterious, you know. And two, in the modern world, there's like so many choices. And and that puts pressure on us. And it could be right now, you've got to make a big decision and you've got all these choices to choose from. Um, I I read a book a few years ago called The Paradox of Choice. And he talks about, the author talks about, his name is Barry Schwartz, all all the choices we have in the modern world that that used to, to not even be an issue. The author writes of a trip to a moderately sized grocery store, and and here's what he found. 285 varieties of cookies, 13 different types of sports drinks, 65 box drinks, 85 kids' juices, 75 iced teas, 95 types of chips and pretzels, 15 kinds of bottled water. By the way, bottled water. Do you know what Evian spelled backwards is? Naive. (laughs) That guy thought it was funny. Just something to think about. (laughs) I thought that's pretty good. 80 different pain relievers, 40 options of toothpaste, 150 lipsticks, 360 types of shampoos, 90 different cold remedies, 230 soups, 75 different types of instant gravy. 275 varieties of cereal, 64 types of barbecue sauce, 22 types of frozen waffles. I don't go to the grocery store very often. Sometimes my wife sends me and she'll be like, pick up some mayonnaise. And I tell you, when I'm standing there and I'm looking, I'm sending her a text. I'm like, sweetheart, you got to be more specific with me. 
But there's so much choice. I, I, I thought about this this week for, for single adults in our church. And, and, and if you're a single adult, I, I just prayed for you. If, if you're married, God's will for you is to not give up, grow up, all right? Love your spouse. If you're a single adult, you still got options. And I just prayed for you because I thought, man, what stress you've got. If you want to get married, if you want to be in a relationship, because, I mean, now everybody's, you know, on these dating sites, and there's lots of them. I looked up Christian, Christian dating sites, and immediately, like, 12 came up. And immediately, it was like Christian Mingle and eHarmony, and uh, it used to be called Equally Yoked. But that sounded weird, so they changed the name of it. But I mean, all these different choices, career, spouse. And I thought about, you know, 150 years ago, people didn't have all that. If you were a single adult 150 years ago, you know, there were like three girls in town and you just chose the one that had most of her teeth. <laughs> and then you went with it. I mean, seriously, have you ever thought about this? Let's just go all the way there for a second. Do you think 150 years ago, people were sitting around asking themselves if they were happy? No, they were too busy surviving. Now we've got all these choices, all these options. And then somebody like me does a series on hearing God and we're just adding to that pressure because you've got to find the specific, specific blueprint, you know, of, of God. And it's, it's hard to find guys. It's, it's just not that difficult. It's just not. God's will is found in God's word. Do what he says. I've got to make decisions. If you will do the general things that God asks of you, the general things. How many of you think he thinks he wants you to pray? Come to church, get in a group, give, serve. All, all the things that we know this is God's will for all of us. Those are his general plans, his general will for all of us. If you will do the general things that God asks of you, then you'll know what to do when it's time to make specific decisions. See, what gets us in trouble is we've got all these choices and options and we're running around and all kinds of different things are in the leadership position of our life because we look to all kinds of different things to bless our life, change our life, all, 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 all of that. And we don't really put God in the top spot of our life. We're not really thinking about him. And then all of a sudden something bad happens or, or it's time to make a big decision. And oh God, we wanna know your will right? But the truth is, if we're doing what he says continually, when it's time to make a specific decision, I'm, I'm going to make you, this sounds cheesy, I know, but I'm going to make you a pastor promise. If you will do the general things God asks of you, you will know the specific things that you're supposed to do. It's, 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 not, it's not a mystery, God's not playing peekaboo. You don't need a crystal ball or any of those kinds of things. He's not holding out on you. What is your next step of obedience? Do that. Just, just do that. The, the other big myth I, I wanna bust is that if you really wanna know God or, or you wanna hear his voice, then you've gotta be like a contemplative mystic. You know, you've gotta wear long robes, wear big hats, something like that, and you gotta live in a monastery or convent somewhere, like those people are really close to God, but I'm just a normal person. Let me just bust that myth. That's not true. That's just not true. We think we have to be a contemplative mystic, like you gotta go to a monastery for people that talk to each other like this. Hello, brother, right? <laughs> the person responds, hello. <laughs> person responds, how are you? I'm okay. <laughs> God loves you right where you are. Look at me. God speaks to ordinary people in ordinary ways on ordinary days. And yet we believe these myths and they're just not, not true. And then you add the pressure of all of these choices. And so here, here's, here's my goal today. Um, is to help you chill out, to equip you to be who you are 
and to equip you to hear God's voice in the context of your personality in the way that God made you. And let's just get rid of these myths because they're robbing us of some precious things that God, that God has for us. John chapter 10, verse 27 is the key verse in this series. I'm gonna begin in verse 10 because I wanna make a point here and then I wanna remind you of the words of Jesus and then I wanna give you five ways to experience, to experience God. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now that's, he's talking about the devil there. So the devil wants to mess up your life. That's what we just read. And he does that by lying to you. And one of the ways he lies to you is that God's will cannot be found or that you have to be a contemplative mystic to figure out God's will and to hear his voice. Both of those things are untrue. Stop believing those lies. If you're like, I'm not special, God can't, you know, I, I need a pastor or a priest or whatever. Okay, I'm here to help you and empower you, but you can hear the voice of God on your own. Don't, don't believe the myths that are, that are out there. Here's what Jesus says, verse 27. My sheep, listen to my voice. I skipped a part there. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and then Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give it to you to the full. And then in verse 27, Jesus says, my sheep, listen to my voice. If you've said yes to Jesus, then Jesus is speaking to you. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the Father are one. If you're a follower of Jesus, he is speaking to you. And, and last week I said, hey, here's, here's several reasons why we can't hear his voice. Here's, here's some things that kind of get in the way. If you weren't here, you can go back and uh, listen to that sermon. I, I think that it will, it will help you. But he's, he's speaking to you. This is not in your notes today. By the way, you can take notes on the Sundialley app. You can download that for free on your mobile device. But let me give you three things you can start to do to hear him. And, and these things are not brilliant. They're very simple. And the cumulative effect of these things is very powerful over time. So if you're taking notes, these are not in the blanks that I've given you. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you three things you can start to do. Um, all of you who are listening right now are doing the first one. You get in church. Ta-da. You wanna hear God, get, in, get involved at church. Like commit to it. Not once a month. Not, not once in a while here and there when you feel like it and you got time. Like commit to it, an advanced decision. Because I'm gonna make you a promise. If, if you attend here at Sun Valley, we're gonna teach you God's word and we're gonna do it in a way that you can understand. I'm not trying to impress you on any given weekend. Robert's not trying to impress you. What we're trying to do is help you and influence you so that you might take your next step of obedience. We try to make it as simple as we possibly can because God has made it as simple as he possibly can. We just need to do what he, what he says. Get involved in church. If you will do that, you will hear the word of God regularly. Uh, let me remind you of something. When Jesus came, he did not show up in the scholarly halls of the day. Jesus was born in a barn to blue-collar people. And for the first 30 years of his life, he had a blue-collar job. He was a carpenter. I heard a pastor one time that said, yeah, he made tables and chairs. No, he didn't. He made tables, but he didn't make chairs because they all sat on the floor or pillows. Everybody with me? That's just a sidebar. He didn't make any chairs. I saw a movie one time and, and, and they were depicting Jesus and it was before he started his ministry and he was making a chair. And Mary comes up and says, what's that? Jesus is like, I don't know. I'm not sure what it's called, but they're saying it's really gonna catch on, right? <laughs> My point is he was a blue collar worker. He was, he was a carpenter. And yet, yet what, 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 do we, what do we think? We think, oh, if I'm not a scholar, if I'm not a reader, if I'm not a contemplative mystic, then I can't hear the voice of God. Oh, wait a second. When God showed up, he was born in a barn. He wasn't trying to impress anyone. He's trying to influence us right where we are. 
So real simple, you wanna hear God? Get in church. You wanna hear God? Get in a group. When you start talking about your real life, because right now it's like me on thousands of you, but if you get in a group, suddenly there's up close conversation over time. That will have an effect on you that preaching will not. I'm gonna give you God's word. It'll be a catalyst in your life, but when you start applying it and doing that with friends who really know you, that takes it to a whole nother level. So get in church, get in a group, the third one, and get in the Bible. Get into God's word so that God's word will get into you. If you wanna know God's voice, it's not a mystery, then go to God's word. Does that make sense? I will hear his voice and his word. Like those two things go together. Now, some of you, you're like, I'm not a reader. Well, God bless you that you live in 2021. Because you can listen to the Bible, you can listen to worship songs, uh, you can do the daily devotional with us, you can sign up at daily.sv.cc and a devotional with somebody sharing scripture will show up in your email box about 4 o'clock a.m. Monday through Friday. And you can get to it when you get to it. There, there are all kinds of resources that you can use in the modern world to get God's word in, into your life. So again, real simple, get in church, Get in a group, get in the Bible, and you will start to know God's will for your life. You, you, you just will. And this whole idea, whoo, ah, I need a Jedi Knight to help me know what the Force is saying. That's Star Wars. That's not the Bible. That's not the truth of Scripture, okay? He is speaking to you. He has spoken. He is speaking. He will speak. And all of it will fall in line with what the Bible teaches. What I want to do in giving you these five ways to experience God is I want to talk about five different personalities. And I want to continue busting this myth that you've got to be a contemplative mystic to hear, hear from God. Think about this with me, and then I'll give you the five. So at my house, I have two boys. So I'm the dad, I'm the father, and I have two sons. Those two sons are very different. They're different ages. One is 18, one is 12. Very different places in life. Uh, they have very different personalities. Uh, one's good at some things, the other's not so good at those things. The other is good at other things that, that the first one's not good at. I, all of that kind of thing, okay? So in my house, think with me, it's the same house rules. It's the same father but I operate with them a, a little differently. Why? Because they're at different seasons in life, they're going through different things, and they have very different personalities. So as I talk about these five ways to experience God, everybody look at me, it's okay to be you. I'm not a reader. That's all right. Think with me. You realize for thousands of years, most people were illiterate. Do you think any of them walked with God? Do you think any of them had a relationship with God after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Of course they did. And none of them could read a thing. There's this idea, you know, you, 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 got, you got to be a scholar. You just can't hear the voice of God. Not true. God made you to be you. He wants to connect with you because he loves you. He made you. You have the personality you have because of him. I'm not talking about the things you do wrong. That's on you. I'm talking about who he created you to be, okay? And he wants to connect with you with you. So let me give you five ways to experience God. First personality type that I want to talk about is the artist. The artist. There's a whole book in the Bible for artists. It's the largest book of the Bible. It's called Psalms. In Psalms, what you have is a bunch of songs and, and, a, and, a, and a bunch of, of poetry. Uh, David wrote a ton of that. Now, David's personality uh, is, is a little different than, than most of us. David was an interesting guy. He was kind of a Renaissance man before there was the Renaissance. Are you with me? He's, he's way before the Renaissance took place. But he was the warrior poet. He was this amazing warrior. He's the guy that, that you know, defeated Goliath. But, but he also was very artistic, and, and he wrote a lot of those psalms. Uh, some of you, you have the heart of an artist. You, you love the worship time in our church. You, you love music. Like you lose yourself in the moment, you close your eyes, you're, you're all about it. Some of you, you're not artists. You're waiting for the music to be over. You're not gonna sing because you're not a singer. And you look down in the front and you see the artist doing this and you're like, 
Do they have a question? <laughs> right? And, and no, they're, they're just lifting their hands to Jesus because they're artists and, and, and they're free in that. And, and they like to sing and all those kinds of things. And you're going, I don't sing. Okay? And, and in the modern world, we don't really sing. I mean, think about it. Where do we sing? Besides church. At a birthday party, maybe. Maybe the seventh inning stretch of a baseball game, if we're really relaxed, right? Take me out to the... But where do, where do we sing? And so some of you right now, you're like, I'm just, I just not, I'm just not gonna do the lift the hand thing. That's not who I am. Look at me as your pastor. Okay. Pay attention to the words. Listen to the music. Maybe close your eyes a little bit. But if you're like, I'm not a singer, that's not my thing. You be you. And also, the people that are lifting their hands, they don't have a question. They're just letting loose. I'm one of them, so give me a break, all right? But we're all different. Is everybody with me? It's okay. It's okay to be you. And if you're like, well, I'm not a singer, but I love the music. Well, that's why we play it loud, because you can sing as loud as you want. Nobody can hear you. <laughs> right? I always tell that joke when I'm talking about this. So you, you just let it rip. Uh, some of you, you you're like, um, I really love music, but I don't necessarily like the, the, the music at, at, at Sun Valley. It's a little different than what I'm used to. I'll say two things in, in response to that. Most of us, if you said yes to Jesus, where, whatever the type of music was in church when you said yes to Jesus, that's usually your favorite church music. So for me, it's the early 90s. I love the music in the early 90s. If you've ever heard of Rich Mullins, or Stephen Curtis Chapman, or any of the people in that time frame, that's my jam. My family makes fun of me when I listen to them, and I don't care. Uh, I'm also from the South, and my parents would play different music right after I met Jesus, and so sometimes I even listen to the Gaither Vocal Band and some people like that. And my family really makes fun of me when I do that. Okay, But usually we love the music, church-wise, that we learned right after we said yes to Jesus and grace got a hold of us. That's normal. Um, if you're like, I just love traditional music, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you some good news today, no matter what location you attend at Sun Valley. We have a traditional service every Sunday at 9 a.m. at our Tempe location in the chapel. Let me just really excite you if you like that type of music. There's a choir. It's hymns, that type of style, and you get the same sermon. So if you're like, that's really, I, I really connect with that, then enjoy the traditional service at 10, 30, 9 o'clock in the, in, the, in the chapel. But not everybody's an artist. Some of us are, some of us aren't. For some of you, you're like, when I feel close to God, I just gotta listen to worship music. I get it, be you. For some of you, you're like, that's not what I do. That's okay, because I'm gonna give you four other personality types. The first one is artist. Second one is scholar. That's what most people think you gotta be. These are the people that really love to read. Uh, they really love to study. Um, and that may or may not be you. Uh, in the church, we've taught everybody that you have to be this to know God, and, and that's, that's not true. But we need artists, and, and, we, need, and we need scholars. Uh, if this is you, get yourself a really good study Bible. I use the ESV study Bible. And study to your heart's con content. If this is you, I wanna give you a verse of scripture to memorize. It's 1 Corinthians 8.1. Here's what it says. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. That would be a great verse for you to memorize if you're a scholar. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Um, just because you know a lot about the Bible, that does not mean you're a mature Christian. Maturity is about obedience. Maturity is about your character. Maturity is about who you are. When God evaluates your life, he wants you to know the scriptures, but he's more concerned of whether or not you're obeying the scriptures. So, for all the scholars, be careful. Because it was the scholars that put Jesus on the cross. They didn't have a clue who he was. And then when they knew who he was, they didn't like it because he was taking away their power. Be very careful with the scholar thing. At the same time, we need scholars. I, I listen to scholars. I have a new assistant here at Sun Valley. Um, he's got a couple of master's degrees working on his doctorate. He's got more degrees than Fahrenheit, right? <laughs> And I'm starting to call him the professor, and he helps me with some different study, study things. Really, really important, but I want to emphasize again, this is not the only thing. The reason we think that all of us have to be scholars is because it's the scholars that write the books that tell us we have to be scholars. Does that make sense? 
The mechanic doesn't write a book telling you how to follow Jesus because he doesn't write books. Does that make sense? And yet I've got a friend that is a mechanic that walks a whole lot closer with Jesus than most seminary professors I've hung out with. So we've, we've just got to be humble in this, okay? Because knowledge puffs up, but love does what? Love builds up. And, and love is the determining factor there of, of maturity. Do we love God? Then we're obeying him. And in that, we're, we're loving people. So there are artists, there are scholars, number three. Uh, some of you, you're activators. You're activators. You're like, I don't want to sit around and study it. I want to go do it. Give me a mission trip. Give me a place to serve. Give me Habitat for Humanity. I want to go to Haiti. You've got a holy discontent about the social issues of our time. And it could be that you're reading, but that's the only thing you want to read is the social issues of our time. If you're an activator, here would be my encouragement. Activate. Activate. Uh, one of the things that activators do sometimes is they look down on everybody else that's not totally pumped and passionate about what the activator is passionate about. Be careful with that. God made us differently. So if you're like an activator and you're all about foster care, just know I'm all about foster care. I wanna help you. I have met with the governor and dug into the system. I know that it's a bureaucratic nightmare. And we're doing what we can to help as many kids as we can. But don't look down on people who are not as passionate about foster care as you are. If your thing is missions in Haiti and you're upset that the whole church is not as fired up as you are about missions in Haiti, that's because God called you to be fired up about missions in Haiti. And I will help you the best that I possibly can. Does this make sense to everybody? Activators, okay, there's a phenomenal side to that, and there's a phenomenal side to each of these, and there's a dark side to each of these, sometimes can become judgmental about everybody else that's not as fired up about that particular thing as they are. So be careful with that. Make sense? Artists, scholars, activators. You know, the Bible says that the church is like a body. Some people are eyes and some people are ears. And some people are feet and some people are hands. But we're all the body of Christ. So in whatever personality you have, go with it, get excited about it, get intense about it, and play your role in the body of Christ. Scholars think everybody needs to be whatever they are. Artists tend to think everybody needs to be what they are. But all of us are together in this thing. It's this beautiful, beautiful body of Christ called the church. Called the church. Artists, scholars, activators. Number four is thinkers. Thinkers. And you're like, well, what's the difference between a thinker and a scholar? Listen close, because some of you are you're not a scholar. I'm going to help you right now. You are a thinker. Listen close. The scholar asks what... The thinker asks, why? The scholar is about information. The thinker is about understanding. That make sense? I know lots of people that have read lots of books, but they can't really tell me what the book means. I know some people, they've read a couple of books, but man, they got that down because they've really thought about it and marinated on it. Thinkers tend to simplify the complex. They tend to dwell on things. Um, thinkers, you are a little bit more contemplative, and at times you can be really weird. Um, I know that because I'm, I'm, I'm one of you. Um, so I grew up in church. I was at church nine months before I was born, and my mom played piano at the front of the church. And um, I went to Sunday school as, as, as a kid. And when I got about eight or nine years old, um, I got kicked out of my Sunday school class. And the reason is, it's okay, it worked out all right <laughs> here today. It's okay, mom, right? She got nervous for a little bit. But the reason is, is, is I, would, I would ask why questions about everything that was being shared. And I was like, I don't get it, that doesn't make any sense. It can't be that, right? And, and I would ask questions that my, you know, <laughs> third grade Sunday school teacher didn't know the answers to. And what happened is over time, people try to stifle that. If you're a thinker, here would be my encouragement to you. Wrestle on. 
wrestle away. There's a verse in Hebrews that says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Anytime somebody's not questioning, here's what I'm, here's what's going through my mind. If you're not questioning, then you're not thinking. It's okay to ask why. It's okay to go, I'm not sure. It's okay to wrestle with it. And let me tell you the beautiful thing that, that, that <laughs> the beautiful thing that I have is I stand on a foundation of truth so I don't have to convince you. Truth always takes care of itself. I'm one of these guys, I don't have to defend the truth. I just have to proclaim it because the truth is powerful and the lies bounce off of that powerful thing. So as you're thinking and as you're asking why, okay, I encourage that. Wrestle with that. Cults control Jesus and Christianity and power. It's two different things. Make sense? It's okay for you to question. It's okay for you to wrestle as long as you stay in the game. Keep pressing on and persevere through it. Artists, scholars, activators, thinkers. There's a bunch of them. I'm only giving you five. Some of you, you're an outdoors person. You're an outdoorsman. Uh, some of you will connect with asking why and really thinking and, and, and really kind of, you know, pushing the envelope with your thoughts. Some of you, you're like, I don't want to do that. I just want to watch a sunrise or, or a sunset. And you connect with God in, in nature. I, I love this verse of scripture. This is written by an artist, <laughs> but it's written to all of you who are outdoors people. Psalm 8, verse 3. Listen to these words. When I consider your heavens, God, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Then he throws one out for the thinkers and the scholars. I ask myself, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. You see how many personalities that hit in a verse? I said this last week, I'm gonna say it again. The heavens declare the glory of God and we're all looking at our phones. You, you know what's missing in our hearing God? It's just our own intentionality. It's not complicated. You don't have to be a contemplative mystic, but you do have to do something. You do have to engage yourself in the relationship regardless of what your personality is. When, when you're outdoors, talk to God. When you're reading a book, involve God. When you're thinking and asking yourself hard questions, involve God. When you're serving and activating and standing up for social justice, involve God. However God made you, wherever you are in life, involve God. He is speaking. He loves you. His sheep know his voice. Do the general things you know you're supposed to do. And then you will know the specific things that he asks of you. He is speaking. If we'll just listen and trust and obey. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me? How many of you would say right now, all locations, you're like, I've got to make a decision. It's a specific thing and I, I need some leadership from God. Would you just lift your hand? I'm gonna pray for you specifically, all locations. If you're thinking, Chad, you can't see me, I can't, but God can. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Let me pray for you. Father, give us wisdom. For these who lifted their hands who need something specific, I pray that even today, I'm just gonna be real specific with my prayer, Father. I, I pray that as they go to bed tonight and as their head hits the pillow the Holy Spirit they would look to you and that you would speak and that they would receive direction from you whether, whether each person wants the direction or not whether it's hard whether it's going to be easy whatever it is I pray you would speak clearly I pray we would trust I pray we would obey and Father, thank you that you love us right where we are. You love us right where we are in our own personality and in our own uniqueness. 
And may we connect with you there. Give us wisdom of these things. Thank you for your love. May we receive it, rest in it, trust it. And may we do whatever you ask of us. In Jesus' name, amen.